everyone. Uh, welcome to the Melbourne Press Club's webinar, How to Report the State Budget. I'm Nick Richardson. I'm CEO of the Melbourne Press Club. And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the grounds of the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land. I'd also like to pay respects to the elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. I'd like to thank our sponsors, without whom these events would be a very rare thing indeed. Today's webinar is designed to help us understand just what goes on in this vast store of facts, figures, data and graphs that make up the budget papers ahead of next week's state budget. For those new to budget reporting, it can be a withering and confusing challenge. Where do you start? What does it all mean? And most importantly, where's the story? So to help us navigate all of that, we have three of Victoria's most seasoned reporters. Richard Willingham is an award-winning senior state political reporter for ABC News in Melbourne. He's been a journalist in this city for more than a decade, joining The Age in 2010 before moving to the ABC in 2017. Heidi Murphy is a television reporter at Channel 9, recently changing careers after 20 years of radio work in Melbourne, including a long stint as executive producer of Neil Mitchell's top-rating morning radio program. She's been an award-winning state political reporter in the 3AW newsroom. Josh Gordon is a senior reporter at The Age, an award-winning journalist and commentator. Josh has almost two decades experience reporting economics and politics in Melbourne and Canberra. He's also been RMIT's ABC Fact Checks Economic and Finance Editor. So over to you, Richard, to lift the veil on those maddening budget papers. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, for everyone, for joining. Um, it is a really good opportunity for you to learn and ask questions. I really want to stress that this is an event for you listening and you at home learning and in the office learning. Um, so please keep your questions coming on the Q&A function on the, on the Zoom chat because we're here to help you um, and navigate the budget. Now, budgets, as Nick said, can be intimidating things. You walk into a room with a whole lot of other journalists and you, you're given a pile of books that are quite big and it can be overwhelming. But the good thing to remember is it's not overwhelming. You're in there usually as part of a team and there's heaps of people you can ask for help, um, including us right now. So it's good to be prepared. First thing to do is, if you can, is probably bring in a copy of last year's budget because it's always good to compare what was forecast, what was said in the last budget and where money was allocated then. And then you can compare it to this year. Now, this year's budget is, as Nick said, going to be one really, really interesting because it's going to have so many problems. Now, the government, this government sort of been able to spend money for a very long time, for eight years. This one is their first real test of, of their, I guess, their, their financial responsibility and their, and their and how they prioritise things. They're going to have to make some cuts. So that in terms of journalism, there's actually lots of really meaty stories that will affect people's lives. In, in the past, but Victorian budgets under the Premier, under this Labor government, have been a lot of money given to everybody, which is, you know, good stories. But this is a sort of, this is probably going to require a little bit more analysis and thoughtful uh, searching through what's in the budget papers. Um, so that's a good thing for journalists. We, 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 we crave data, especially from a government that doesn't always hand it out. So this is a really big opportunity. Um, we'll try not to overwhelm you with too much information today, but like I said, please hit us up with all your questions. Um, I'll just start. The first thing I'd look for is, is budget paper number two. It's sort of this it outlines the strategy and outlook. And there's a couple of key figures in there that you can scroll to straight away, including the state's um, bud, uh, surplus or deficit. And it will be a deficit this year. That gives you a picture of what the sort of government's dealing with. It also includes the net debt. Now, net debt is going to be a really important figure this time around because the government has spent, borrowed so much money to not just pay for for COVID things, but for all its infrastructure agenda as well. The other key things to just look for in that sort of opening budget paper number two, it sort of sets out the context for the, the financial environment, the economy that the government is working in, and it has their assumptions about how they're planning this based on things like unemployment, population growth, and it sort of just sets the tone. 
it also includes uh, budget initiatives. And this year, we'll be probably looking for things that aren't there. Um, and on that note, um, I might hand it over to, to Heidi. Heidi, what do you look for first when, when you start going through those budget papers? Um, pretty similar to you, uh, Richard, I would start with budget paper number two. I, I did bring props along today. Um, I take a lot of post-it notes into lockup with me. I take highlighters. Um, as Richard says, that that first document does is a good read first off, I think, and you you not you jot down those couple of um, key figures that you're going to want around uh, state debt, around growth forecasts, around what really what the state's overall financial position is. And the, there'll be overall some details of, of spending, where they think wages will go. There's usually an overview of taxes in there. It's, it really is a very broad overview document and you'll find some details in there around um, sometimes wh whose fault things are. Um, I think in this last this last budget was um, a federal government underfunding was part of of one of the the series of issues that were confronting the state's bottom line. Uh, from there, I'd normally go into, especially this budget, I reckon, uh, the state capital program. That's budget paper number four, and that's the book where you're going to find out what's been delayed, what's been pushed back a little, um, where there's been some cost changes. Or it may be that you find there's no detail in there or not enough detail in there because there's a federal government review that's underway, particularly for this budget. Normally, you'd find all, those, all of those details in uh, budget paper number four, which is called State Capital Program. So the title sort of gives it away on each, on each of the booklets. Um, one year, we didn't have that booklet at all. They weren't reporting on, on major projects. Uh, this year, they will have that book, I think, They'll just have a lot of up for review asterisks, which is a story, which is an interesting thing to look for. Um, and then further on, there's like, you know, there's statement of finances, which is number five. This is the one that I think there'll be a fair bit of interest in this year too, because this is the one where you'll find details of tax. It'd be called um, revenue initiatives. Revenue initiatives is how they're planning to make money. That's what you're looking for 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 um, tax increases, for um, new taxes, that sort of detail, when you're looking for really specific details, it'll be mentioned in the Strategy and Outlook book, that first one we talked about looking at, and then there'll be more detail in the Statement of Finances one. Um, I think, Josh, did you want to add anything? I think you've summed it up really well, Heidi. I, I can't add much. I mean, it is also useful to have a skim through the Treasurer's speech, which is also included as a separate budget document because that kind of gives you a, a very overarching, albeit, you know, one with the government spin on it, but an overarching view of the kind of key themes of the budget, so it's sort of how they want the public to receive the budget. Um, you know, it'll have the kind of the main slogan of the budget, like, you know, fairness or families or whatever it is. Um, it will also contain the sort of broad uh, economic outlook and the, the, the fiscal outlook, the sort of financial outlook, uh, and also the key big ticket policy spending decisions that the government wants you all to know about. So sometimes just as a really quick kind of first take, I skim through that initially uh, and then as as both Heidi and Rich said um, you know then you look at um, budget paper number two which is the strategy and outlook and you can get a very broad overview like there's a the first table in that budget paper I think is table 1.1 which just has some of the broad uh, parameters in there like the the deficit or surplus net debt, net debt to GDP is an, or, or gross state products, or I should say GSP, it's not the federal budget. Um, that's another measure that sort of gets looked at quite a lot and you probably want to compare some of those things to the previous year's budget and the, and the budget updates throughout the year to sort of see, you know, how they've, how they've moved compared to what State Treasury was predicting earlier. Um, I, I think um, Nick's description of, of being in a lockup as a withering experience is a really good way to describe it. It can feel like you're back at uni sitting an exam a little bit. You know, there's that kind of intense Except feeling. Except it's catered. Or, it's catered, but, uh, yeah, and, and I think um, there's, there's a lot of discussion among journalists in the room about the quality of the catering. Um, I was actually recently just covering the federal budget, um, 
and and that used to be covered in Parliament House in Canberra, um, in a in a massive sort of central area of Parliament House, but now it's all all sort of confined to the individual bureaus, and so now um, at the age we go to the Sydney Morning Herald and the Treasury officials come to the Sydney Morning Herald building in North Sydney. Uh, and so the Sydney Morning Herald did all the catering for that, which was which was great. Um, and then afterwards, we just all had beer and pizza. So it was, um, th- there is a, a sort of also, it's like sitting an exam afterwards, you get this sense of relief. And, uh, you know, you can have a, have a beer and eat some unhealthy, greasy, salty pizza and uh, think about what you should have said and what you didn't say. And, um, you know, uh, try to try to sort of mull, mull over the whole thing. So, so Josh, before you, before we get to that enjoyable bit afterwards, can you just explain a little bit about how to read the Ford estimates? So, the government may say, for an example, there's two hundred million dollars for a hospital in Footscray. It's not. Yep. How do we report that in the Ford estimates? Like, it might be just you know, how, what's the the government may spin it one way. How do we look at those? Can you just explain that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Basically, when they talk about a budget, it's always talking about the coming financial year. So, for example, when they, this budget will be about the 23-24 financial year. So that runs from July 1, 2023 to June 30, 2024. So that's the budget year. And then there's three years after that that are called the forward estimate. So it's a really a four-year sort of um, thing that you're looking at. Um, and, and, and then beyond that, I mean, so, sometimes governments can be quite misleading because they'll couch things in, you know, like te- a 10 year time frame. So they might have a, a huge number, like, you know, $10 billion. And then you'll read the fine print and go, okay, well, that's actually over 10 years. So you've got to make sure that you're comparing apples and apples in terms of the time frame, which can be tricky. Um, but what you want to do is go, if, if you want to know how much funding is allocated in each year, um, you really need to look at the individual budget measures, um, which will be included in the budget. So you sort of got to dig down into the detail to see how much funding is allocated to each year, because sometimes they can they can sort of do you know quite quite slippery things where they'll they'll talk about a big number, but a lot of it's allocated in you know. T- 20, 26, 7 or something like that. So it's, it's sort of on the never-never and who knows what's going to happen then, uh, if that makes sense. The big things that we've already heard is that there's going to be some significant job cuts. I think our friends from CPSU might be listening and I'm pretty disappointed about that. But, how, Heidi, how do we find out? We, we, we know there's, there's a thing in there that says employee expenses. How do we find out? if the government is cutting jobs and, and where do we find that? Well, you, that will be one indication if the uh, employee expenses plan to go down, if they're forecast to be dropping off by a significant uh, portion. They are one of, if not the biggest expense on the budget, uh, on the on the state's bottom line is employee expenses. They do have to cut it. How they'll, how they'll show that to us, I think you'll find it in the Strategy and Outlook booklet it will mention what needs to happen in terms of efficiencies that are being found or efficiency targets that are being set. Usually there's a line that talks about um, reducing consultancies um, or departments needing to find efficiencies. Whether they try to report it department by department in terms of efficiencies or right across the public sector, it will be in that um, strategy and outlook book as a, as a chapter heading at some stage in it, probably uh, a little under budget position and outlook or the um, chapter five, oh, chapter four or five, I think, of the, of the, um, of the strategy and outlook paper. Heidi, do you think they'll spell it out for us or do you think it'll be hidden? Oh, I think it'll be s- spelled out but in, in words <laughs> that are a bit more convoluted than we would, than we would use um, and you just have to quite figure out what the sentences are saying. I think they have to spell it out, don't they? I mean, we had the Treasurer at the back door of Parliament the other day saying um, we need to be accountable to, to taxpayers for the dollars that we spend. We need to be sure that we're getting value for, for money. 
we the taxpayer. So they will have to, I think they'll have to spell it out and and clearly it's just whether they choose to cover it in lots of words. I get the feeling that this time they might want to spell it out in the sense that, you know, as Rich was saying in his introduction, we've had a lot of budgets where they've had all this money and they've sort of been all things to all people and then we had this massive amount of spending that was unleashed during the pandemic to try to insulate the economy. Uh, now they're really battling this perception and it's a genuine perception that the state's debt has been creeping higher and higher and it's something that the ratings agencies are going to be looking at. So I think, among other things, they want to send a signal not only to the public that they're taking some tough decisions, uh, but also to those financial markets and, and ratings agencies that they're sort of being a little bit hairy-chested about cutting back on some spending. I think the interesting thing about it might be whether or not the, the reality of those spending cuts actually matches up with their rhetoric. Um, mm. You know, like, it's it, again, it's one of those things where you want to look at the timing. Um, so it could be spread over a number of years. Um, you know, I, I mean, our friends at the CPSU might balk at this bit, but, um, <laughs> you know, whether or not it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, voluntary redundancies and sort of job cuts by attrition over time so just people retiring and moving on to other jobs um you know they could they could do it in quite a sort of measured slow way um, yeah they, they won't they won't sort of say we're cutting a thousand jobs or two thousand jobs there won't yeah. be a full-time equivalent number spelled out if you if you're looking for a, how many people are they going to sack that number won't physically be there yeah I, I might i mean they might have some detail like are, are you guys you reckon well, remember um, the Bayou government had those, um, that was sort of the last time there were some really big um, job cuts. Uh, and they, they actually spelt out, you know, how many people would be going from individual departments, I think, from memory. So I don't know whether or not they'll do that again, um, but there might be... I, I suspect one of the themes of this budget, uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but one of the themes could be that they're sort of, you know, um, having to take tough decisions to sort of start getting the state's finances back on track and, and they may actually want to sort of feed that perception a little bit, I think, and talk tough a little bit. And, and remember, it's the first um, budget of a four-year political cycle as well. So if they're going to take tough political decisions around uh, taxes and spending, uh, it's probably the right time to do it. Just in terms that we've talked about cuts, if programs are winding up and not being renewed, will they be included in the budget or is that something we're going to have to rely on previous budgets to work out whether they're being renewed or not to either of you? Do you want to take this one, Heidi? Uh, no, here you go, Josh. Uh, well, look, I mean, that, that, that can be quite tricky often working out um, and sometimes it's not until after you all get out of the lockup that you can actually sort of work out what's going on when you've got people that scrutinise things in more detail. And, the, you know, you get all the lobby groups and, and the opposition. Um, I mean, part of the purpose of a lockup is really to contain journalists so the government can very much sort of put their slant on a budget um, and so sometimes it takes a bit of time to actually sift through some of that finer detail and work out uh, what spending programs have been cut. I mean, there, there will be, like, if there's big cuts, they tend to sort of spell that out, but sometimes you've actually got to really go through it with a fine-tooth comb. Um, you know, there might be some program that they haven't renewed uh, that you don't actually know about until afterwards, maybe the next day or something like that. So it can it can be one of it's one of the tricky things about budgets. You know, um, I think I think lockups are partly about you know there's an argument that it's it's market sensitive information and you know you can't have journalists sort of feeding information out to the public before the treasurer has got up to deliver a budget that evening in, or that afternoon in Parliament. But there is another argument uh, that says um, 
that it's partly about governments really wanting to control the messaging around budgets because it's a so one one of the few opportunities they get to really sort of own the messaging uh, and you know there's a big process leading up to budgets as well where they sort of drip feed things out to journalists um, you know in a, in a very controlled way and they they really try to control the message doing that and then on the day they also try to control the message to quite a strong extent as well. I think I, to pick up on something you said there, Josh, I think the, the lobby groups will know exactly what they are looking out for. They'll be far more invested. They'll be heavily invested in particular projects or particular schemes, especially, say, like concession schemes. I know VCOS will be across every detail of what they expect to see there, what they know from past history is there. They'll know if it's not there. So after you're out of budget lockup, you can then get in touch with them and say, was that thing you wanted there? Was it not there? Show me the paper. And then you go, you have back and forth with um with the treasurer's office or with a someone you've met in the in the budget lockup, one of the treasury officials to just bounce it off them. Um but yeah, I, I would I would always touch base. If you've got a particular area of interest, I'd always touch base with the particular stakeholders before you go in because they'll have some expectations. You can check what's in there. Um you can check what's in there in the old papers and then you can um, see when you're in lockup, when, you, when you've got the budget papers in front of you, the new ones, if it's there, um, just as a way around, a way of being a little bit prepared in advance. If there's something in particular, similar with a, with a big project, like say uh, Melton Hospital, if you are particularly interested in that project and you remember it was in last year's budget and there was money announced and it was in this particular year, you go through um, you go through the capital program, and you can see if any of those reporting dates or dollar amounts have changed. If it's been pushed further back, there's your story. If it's been delayed, or the money's moving further and further away, or completion estimated completion dates are changing, you have to compare it to last year's documents. I think it's a really good reminder too that um, the, the budget reporting doesn't stop on budget day so there, there's there's so much information there there'll be some on budget day there's the big headline stuff which which we all cover but it's, it's worth bearing in mind that some stories you'll you'll do in the days and weeks afterwards so you might see something that's really little and interesting while you're in there just make a little note of that you can come back to it um we've got a question from the audience and please keep them coming in can we please explain the difference between an operating surplus and a cash surplus and why do both matter i think this is one definitely for josh gordon uh, well, I'll do my best. So a cash surplus is pretty simple. Um, it's just revenue versus spending. So if if the amount of spending is exceeding the amount of revenue you're getting in a particular year, you're going to be running a deficit. You're going to run a surplus if it's the other way around. So that's fairly simple. And an operating surplus is a bit more complicated. It basically, in a nutshell, takes into account uh, the depreciation of assets as well. So it's a bit more of a sort of broader look at the state's financial position. Generally, when a politician talks about a surplus or deficit, they're almost always talking about an operating surplus or deficit. And that's that's really what matters when you're reading the budget paper. So, um, yeah, so, you know, if you're looking at um, budget paper number three, um, the, uh, uh, which is, sorry, budget paper number two, um, yeah, the, the kind of headline surplus figure will be the, the net result from transactions, but it will be the operating surplus rather than the cash surplus. So one of the confusing things in recent budgets is um, Tim Powers has talked about this four-step fiscal strategy uh, to sort of get the state clear of the pandemic. So I think, I think the first step was to spend to protect jobs then he spoke about bringing the budget back to a cash surplus. So that, that happens relatively quickly, and that's, as I was saying, just when revenue exceeds spending. But then the next step, step three, is the bringing the budget back to an operating surplus, which is the more challenging sort of thing. And then the final step is beginning to pay down debts. So uh, hopefully I'm not rambling on too much, but... Debt, you can only pay down debt when you're running operating surpluses. So basically debt is the kind of accumulated result of running deficits over time. It's the stock. It's like a stock of deficits. So deficits are an annual thing that happen or surpluses. 
and debt is the accumulated result of that over time. Um, there's also a difference between gross debt and net debt. Um, Can you explain that, Josh? I'd, I'd love to explain. And, and which one? And which one should we be reporting? Which one's more informative? Well, they, they both they both kind of matter. Um, I mean, gross debt is just the total amount of borrowing that the Treasury Corporation in Victoria has to undertake. Most of the borrowing is done by selling government bonds, Treasury Corporation Victoria bonds. They sell them like they can. A bond is just an agreement to repay a certain amount of money in the future at a particular rate of interest. So there's three-year bonds, one-year bonds, 10-year bonds. Um, so they issue those bonds to the public to raise money. Um, and 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 they and the total bonds on issue at any one time is sort of the gross amount of debt that they accumulate. Net debt just nets out interest bearing so, well some interest bearing assets. So if the government has shares or something that they can quickly sell to offset the debt, then that's that's how you measure net debt. Um, they have all sorts of yeah short term kind of interest bearing assets that offset some of that debt. So it's just a it's just an offsetting measure. Um, some people would say net debt provides a better measure of the state's actual liabilities because you can quickly you know sell sell things sell it's, it's sort of liquid assets that you can get rid of quickly to to offset your debt. I hope that answers the question there. We're not doing any offsetting of debt, though, are we, really? Um, they, they do. There is a difference between um, gross debt and net debt um, at the moment. But, uh, yeah, I mean, look, what the, the figure most people tend to focus on is the net figure. Net debt, yeah. Yeah, because it's just a bit more of a meaningful, you know, it's a bit more of a meaningful sort of um, measure of the state's actual kind of liabilities. So we're agreed we're all using net debt, great. Yeah, but then I, I don't know, pe people federally often use gross debt, you know, in the federal budget because it's, it's a much bigger number. It sounds more impressive. Uh, you know, it's like a trillion, it's hitting, it's heading towards a trillion dollars or hundred. I think the state's debt's past a hundred billion or something. Um, so that's uh that's a good good round number as well. We've got a question from Matthew Langdon, and um, he wants to know. You know, health has been such a big area of focus during during COVID, obviously. Do we think that health will be a, a key focus of this budget or as the government and newsrooms moved on? I mean, I think I'll, I can start answering that. I think that it is, this is going to be a budget that's not so much focused on health. I think health would probably of any department is likely to be quarantined from any savage cuts um, because the state of the system is is so bad, as we, as we all know. Um, I don't think we'll see the C word in the budget very often unless it's being used as an excuse for the state of the, 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 the budget. Um, what, what's I, the C word, Richard? The COVID. COVID. Oh, okay. I, I, see, I disagree. I think they'll use it quite a bit because it'll all be COVID repair plan, COVID yeah, repair plan, which I means I... An excuse. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes, go on, Heidi. Oh, no, that's all. I was just to, to, to explain here's why this program has to cut, here's why this has to wait, here's why this time frame has changed, here's why, um, yeah, we have to make, find these efficiencies, why we have to bring in these new initiatives. I think it'll be all COVID repair, COVID repair, COVID repair, which isn't quite Matthew's, Matthew's question, I know, it, but um, the health system is still pretty smashed and I think it will have to be a focus. Perhaps it's not the front page. Like it was <laughs> think so this time um, around. last time around, but you know it 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 has to be a pretty big thing in there. Infrastructure and health are their two main drivers. Josh, any thoughts on the this health and whether it'll dominate or not? Uh, look, I, I think as both of you guys are saying, I mean, it has to be like health is always a massive issue. It's one of the things that state governments are responsible for predominantly. Uh, and so it's always a big issue. It's seen as a kind of labour, one of their issues where they have a comparative advantage in health. So they're not going to want to give up that comparative, comparative advantage. And it was such, remember, a big feature of the election campaign, uh, which I think raises an important point. Like um, it, it's also the first budget after the election campaign. So a big part of this budget's just going to be delivering on their campaign promises. Which the uh, Premier has made clear is the things yeah. like quarantine that 
You know, if it was yeah. promised in the election, it doesn't matter if it's too expensive, they'll they'll be doing it. Exactly. Yeah. And given that, I mean, so much, you know, you, you guys would remember better than about just about anyone, but so much of the campaign was about health and hospitals that I don't think they can avoid talking about health uh, in this budget. And, and also um, just demonstrably, they've got a lot of ground to make up in, in getting the health system, you know, back in shape after it was sort of really knocked about during the pandemic um and uh you know so i think i think they'll have to they'll have to talk about health a fair bit and i think given given all of that too um it it means that they're apt to pay for all of that to pay for all the election promises to pay for lifting the health system up um for all the focus on that it it does absolutely mean there has to be bigger efficiencies there has to be new taxation initiatives or other initiatives or something sold. I don't think there's anything much left to sell or lease out. So there'll have to be initiatives that you've got to keep an eye out for, things that have been cut back, jobs that are going to go or um, or new new taxation initiatives. Those are three things I'd be looking for. Where do we look for those um, new taxes and, and, and charges increases? Is there a particular it, book we should be looking at? It will. It will spell it out in number three. There's a whole taxation sort of chapter in there. Is there a chapter? Yeah. Um, it's called something else. Uh, number five, maybe? And it is in number statement, five as statement well. Statement of finances. Yeah, statement of finances. It's a big chapter. Just you just go to the first page or two and it's there. Yeah, chapter I think, four, I think state revenue. That's all the all the revenue initiatives. Table 1.2.5, I think, is lists all the different types of taxes. And then after that, um, there's another useful table that's other other revenue, which is all the um, – it's a bit like the sort of uh, beer and cigs equivalent in the state budget. People always look for fees and fines and, you know, traffic fines and stuff like that. Um, the lines. Yeah, so that's that's all listed in budget paper number five. Um, as you were saying, Heidi, fa- fairly uh, fairly close to the front. I think fairly close to the front. Yeah, uh, and then uh, chapter in budget paper number five. It's chapter four is a, a bit more of an explainer. Um, for, in your preliminary read, I I don't know how big a feature it would be in his speech, but in your preliminary read, it will it will come up in your strategy and outlook as well when you're just having a glance through. But more of the detail is yeah in the statement of finances for that. And, so and got, think, sorry, Rich. I was just going to say we got a few questions coming in. Um, Chad wants to know where to find the cost of state government programs like the regional public transport fare cap. That should be in either statement of finances or state capital program. Josh, Heidi. Yeah, there's also service um, delivery. Yeah, yeah, service there's delivery. exactly. Yeah, budget paper number three is called service delivery, uh, which does set out the kind of pro- um, the government's priorities for services. Um, and the costs of providing those services to Victorians. And it basically breaks down, um, it sort of sets it out by performance targets and how whether or not those performance targets have been met. So it's kind of it's kind of quite useful for individual journos who are rounds people that might want to really delve into, you know, what the education department's doing, have they met their targets, what are their kind of key initiatives and, and that sort of thing. So that, that can be quite useful, although if you want a sort of overarching kind of macro view of the budget, it sort of t- tends to be that you either look at um, the budget overview or the statement of finances just on that on that budget paper number three, the service delivery. It's actually a, it's a bit of a tip of mine. Is it's a really good book to to go back to in the weeks after the budget because you can look at it. It has a heap of government performance measures, stuff like you can go into it and it'll have the Department of Justice. You can look at the recidivism rate, so how many people are returning to prison, and it'll it'll set its own targets whether it's met that or not. And there's just a heap of data in there that you can find great little stories which. Are overlooked on budget day, and because it's it's not as pressing, but it's a really good source of information and a really good place to follow up. So that's budget paper number three. Um, another question here from the floor is how much of the big infrastructure projects and big ticket items in the budget is funding that's already been announced? Now this is a really good question because the government will try and spin. They might say this is an eight billion dollar train track, but some of the money will either not be in the forward estimate estimates. I think the Melton Hospital is a classic example of this. Not Melton, yes, the Melton Hospital, which was promised before the 2018 election, 
and it, the money's actually never in the budget because it's not going to be completed or construction started stuff yeah. for a long time. So it might be a line item in the budget, but the key giveaway is that there'll be no, in the four years, there'll be four columns, there'll be actually no money allocated. So this is a really, really important point. So when governments say we're funding X, it may not even be in this budget. It's just, it, it might be in contingencies, but it's not actually allocated over the four years. And it's something that governments try and do sometimes is say we're yep. spending $10 million on this. And I think, Heidi, you can explain. Can to show you? Yeah. So I'll just show you. This is the New Melton Hospital, if you can see it there. Can you see New Melton Hospital? And see how it's got all the TBCs at Cobble Bank? It's just got TBCs across there. Can you actually see that, though? Is it close yep. enough? Not really. Yeah. That's the New Melton Hospital at Cobble Bank. It's just got all... Uh, so this is in, you go to State Capital Program, budget paper number four. It's broken down into departments. You go to the department you're looking for, health, and you go through their list of new projects or existing projects. The title is there. This one says New Melton Hospital, Cobble Bank, 900 to a billion dollars. And then estimated expenditure in each of the four years on there, TBC. TBC, TBC. Um, so nothing. Well, it will be disclosed following further project planning and development that will be completed, the planning and development design to be completed, not even in this coming financial year, the one after. So have a look for dates for that in this coming budget. I, by the sounds of that, it won't be there. It's a, really, it's a really good reminder just to, if you've got time, if, if you are going in on Tuesday, if you've got time before then, just to have a flick through last year's budgets, just to have a familiarise yourself with what they look like if you've never done one before. So um, I think that's a really, really good point. Um We've got a, question, a few more questions. Uh, what does the panel think of the suburban rail loop and the airport rail link's future? Will this budget be the end of those projects? Uh, no, I don't think it will be, um, especially the suburban rail link. Regardless of its merits, this government's going to push on through. Um, and we think with airport rail link, it'll be delayed. They'll, they'll, they'll make some savings on money because they won't, a bit like what I was talking about before with the forward estimates, they will push a lot of the spending of this away from now. So it's not sort of affecting their bottom line as much. Um, anyone else? And I reckon, they may, I reckon they may even just put under review, not even give timelines because then they don't have yeah. to do anything until next next budget cycle in terms of public reporting on it in the form that we would normally read it. I think, I think another thing just on that to look out for is sometimes they there's all these sort of hollow logs in the budget <laughs> that they can kind of tap into. And so that sometimes, you know, there's this thing called the contingency reserve, which is a kind of rainy day fund to pay for contingencies. But sometimes they fund uh, projects out of money. You know, it's, it's not really on the books. You know, a really famous example was um, in the federal budget, you know, um, the former coalition government were, you know, still sort of had their heart set on building the East-West link. And that was always a line. There was always a kind of footnote where they had this thing where this this is to be paid for out of the contingency reserve. So it's not actually a line item in the budget. It's just a kind of thought bubble almost. But they're saying, oh, yeah, there's these hollow logs in the budget. And if, if a state government, you know, the Victorian government were to build it, we would pay for it out of the contingency reserve in the budget. And, yeah, so you've you got to kind of look for those little footnotes and the fine print sometimes about how projects are being funded. Sometimes they might cancel another project and say, well, we're funding this out of that cancelled money that was set aside in a previous budget. Um, and so there's all sorts of accounting tricks that they can use as well. Um, and you just, there's no nice way to find out what they are other than to kind of read the fine print sometimes and and that I mean that that often you know it's one of those day two things that you sort of realize in the wash up uh that they've kind of uh actually done a bit of a swifty and shuffled some money around so and I would say to um the oh no god I've remembered I forgot what I was going to say never mind come back to me <laughs> we'll come back to Heidi um Obviously, interest rates are a really big topic for households. They also affect governments. So where do we look in the budget to find out how interest rates are pushing the debt up? That, that, uh, oh, 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 sorry, Heidi, you go. No, no, I was just going to say that it's in strategy and outlook, I think. Yeah, there's there's a few references to it, but the Treasury is a little bit vague about, about the interest rate predictions that they use. Um, they basically just use the market consensus, but they don't actually say what the market consensus is. So they're, they're quite vague about it. What you can find is 
interest costs. So, which is a measure of um, you know how much how much money each year they're spending on interest, which is is quite a useful measure. And and then you can kind of break that down further by expressing that as a as a proportion of total revenue. So, for example, I think um, in the last budget, oh, maybe it was in the budget update, they predicted that this financial year they'd be spending about $3.8 billion on interest costs, I think, from memory, but they're predicting that that's going to rise to $7.4 billion or thereabouts. So that that would sort of go from about, you know, 4.75% of total revenue to 8%. So it's quite a big increase in the interest costs to the state. Um, but I think this time that is going to be one of the really interesting parts of the budget because in recent weeks we've seen Daniel Andrews, the Premier, complaining a lot about the Reserve Bank raising interest rates. He's had a really quite an unusually strong crack at them and said, well, well, the state government's just like households. You know, we were told to go out and borrow to insulate the economy from the pandemic, and now the Reserve Bank, you know, then they told us that interest rates would be on hold, and now they've gone out and lifted interest rates. And, you know, what what was us? Um, Josh, is that just him blaming someone else rather than taking responsibility? Just well, I think I think it is, but I think he's also creating a narrative to sort of prepare the public for what what I reckon they're going to have to upgrade their predictions about those interest costs in the budget, and so they're kind of creating this narrative in advance. That's what they do. They sort of try to shape the narrative a bit leading up to a budget, um, and I think I think that could be one of the interesting stories in the budget that potentially. Brings us, that brings us to a question from Courtney, who who asks when we're reading the treasurer's speech. What are the tips for reading around the spin? And I think the answer is what's actually in the document. So mm. the, it's a spin and, and the, the, the thing is the document speaks for itself and the, the, what the Treasurer says, will, as Josh pointed out, will outline the key things they're trying to hit, but it is their spin. And I think when you've got something like the budget, you've actually got five books of, of data to, to tell you what's really going on. I should say to you, um, when you first walk in and there are those five books that we talked about, um, there's also just a like a giant sleeve full of media releases that you are handed. You can choose to read them or, or not, but they can also sometimes they'll be put in in an, in an order that they want you to approach it in. That they So it'll be the first couple of big things that they want to hit. I and am normally- told there's less this year, Heidi. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I think they've well, realised they were wasting trees by doing so many media releases that no one reads. Quite a number of trees. Um, I remember what I was going to say what before. Yeah. And that that was when you're looking for, if you're opening and looking for a particular project, like we were saying, say, with Melton before, if you can't find the name of the project in there, like there's not a big flashing light, suburban rail loop, all the costs right here line, walk over to someone at the side of the room. There are Treasury officials all around the place and just go, I can't, sorry, where, where am I finding suburban rail loop? We did this last year or the year before. Where's hotel quarantine? Where where's Mickleham? Where's where's where are those line items reported? Sometimes they can't tell you because they're not there. So they, they that's your answer. And you and you are allowed in the lockup to talk to these um, treasury boffins. You can't quote them, but that you they you know the information they give you is usable. You just can't quote them directly. I've had a couple. Yeah, just don't, just don't sit sit there making yourself crazy going. I can't find it. Just get up and say where is it? What what yeah. page am I looking at? Or ask Josh. Or ask Josh. But, and I'll, I'll probably won't know, but, um, I mean, the, the other thing is the Treasurer does get up in the budget lockup and, and give a press conference and a little presentation with lots of slides and nice pictures. So journalists do have an opportunity to ask the Treasurer questions as well. And it's really good opportunity if you are a, a like a novice first-timer or even your second time in the budget. If you listen to what the journos, experienced journos are asking, it's usually like a bit of a giveaway of the, the important issues. Um, got a, had a couple of people ask this question to the panel is what are mistakes that you've made or seen made that you've learned from in covering a budget? Um, I, I think I'll start there if you want. I think sometimes you can, if you're just, if, if you're doing the headline story, the, the main trunk story, you, you can get bogged down in reading too much. I think it's really in terms of serving the audience, whatever audience that may be, it's, it's picking out, five or six really key points. It does become a bit of a listicle, but that's okay when you're doing big budget stories. Um, 
that's a mistake that sometimes and you can you can get in a panic because you're like oh shit I haven't read this I haven't read that but you know you're usually working in a team and so just just talking to everybody listening to what happens in the press conference asking people and, and you sh- you should be fine Heidi uh, I have sometimes looked for uh, a project or uh, a, an initiative and found found it. I thought, but the money doesn't add up. It's not the right. It's not the right amount. It's much smaller, or it's a it's a different one, or um, it's because there's in some of the reporting of these things there's asset initiatives and output initiatives, and you need to look at both of them separately and add them together. So they're you're looking through the the um, the budget papers, and you're looking at, say, Department of Health, uh, and you've seen one set of co- of numbers, and you go a few pages on, and there's a whole another set of numbers, and they're not the same numbers. You're like, what is what is happening? Asset initiatives and output initiatives, and the dollar amounts have to sort of add together. That's caught me out a, f- a few times over the years, and it's normally when I've gone to just say someone at the side of the room, I thought this was going to be this much money. They go, oh yeah, have you added it to that page over there? Yeah. I I think um, just uh, to reiterate what Rich was saying, you can kind of get this deer in the headlight feeling where you just can get petrified by or sort of frozen by this sort of sheer volume of information. Uh, And so you really got to take a deep breath and say, well, what's the, you know, what's the main theme here Um, and what are the key points? And as Rich was saying, I think that was, you know, you come up with five five key points and then you can add you can add more detail but just don't get too bamboozled by all these documents and numbers and they're quite it's quite an intense uh environment you know there's lots of people talking and asking questions and sort of saying i can't find this and where's that and um it can be quite a stressful environment but you've just really got to try to try to not do too much and not get fixated on any one thing too much um, and take a very overarching sort of view of it and tell tell readers you know or, or listeners or viewers what they want to what they want what what they're interested in what matters to them what they need to know what they need to know um, we've got another question where do we look for new agencies being created or being dissolved back in departments as budget costs or saving measures? interested party there asking that question um you'd go department you'd have to go department by department depending which one you're looking for if you know which department it is within and the agency is no longer listed there or there's a fresh one that's come up it should be or stay on the finances maybe so or maybe service delivery it, it may also be put in initiative measures in that first um in budget paper number two especially if it's part of a sort of a, an overall if it's part of an efficiency drive or a, strategy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. We've got a question about um, the cost of living and, and fund relief. How do you, how do we think the electricity rebates will help people manage their daily lives or is it just a political political sop? I think I, you know, I think I can answer $250 for anybody is, is always going to be helpful um, and it will be accounted for. It would be really interesting to see where that $250 is accounted for, like who who which department's picking up the tab for that which program it's being allocated to so that's one to watch out for on election day on oh, election day budget day budget day <laughs> the <laughs> election's a long way off that's why this could be such a fun budget last year. <laughs> last year. um we've got one last question talking about the variation the way that government presents information in different budget papers what are some common variants? I think you spoke about this just then, Heidi, about um, assets and, and outlay and all that sort of stuff. So how do we how do we work through that, or is it one of those things that is is not important on on the day? I know that it's. I mean, depending wh- where you're working, what what masthead you're working for, or what news service you're you're working for, I, I, it may be something that is you can look more at, at it later, like down the track. I don't know if it is a is an on the day sort of story. Josh, any thoughts there? Um, not really. Um, I yeah, I, I, it's it's sort of. I mean, I think one of the challenges is your they do change the way budget papers are presented, uh, and so it can be hard to compare apples and apples sometimes across different budgets. And to some extent, um, you're sort of at the mercy of how they how they present it. Um, you just you just have to try to try your best, I think. 
Yeah, like sometimes, so say in the, the service delivery one, if you're looking up a particular thing, like I often look through there for um, how many breath tests were done, say, in the last year, and there's a, you know, the, whole, the unit of measures there, the target, the expected outcome, the target for next year, the actual outcome um, or the actual outcome for this year, the expected target for next year. And sometimes, and that, that's per department for all sorts of different, um, different things, can be um, ratings for things, surveys for things, all deliverables of things. But sometimes they just they'll just change what they want to measure. We're not going to measure breath tests this year. We're only going to measure drug tests, and then or they'll bring in a whole new one, and it's the first year of reporting. It'll have a little NM next to it for for the current year because it wasn't measured the current year. It's a new thing they're wanting to measure, so that that can be frustrating. But it's it's sort of a bit unless you've got a particular interest in a particular thing, it, it's probably a little off to the side on budget day. Um, Julian Canelli from the CPSU is helpfully mentioned that the Victorian Public Sector Commission site has really useful data on service and sector staff numbers and classifications, which is probably helpful to, to cross-check. Um, we might wrap it up now. Just, Josh, Heidi, any last thoughts or any last tips as people head in for their last, uh, for their first budget or their second or their 40th? Josh? Uh, stay calm, breathe. Um, don't get, yeah, don't get that kind of deer in the headlights sort of thing don't let that get the better of you um just and be targeted like i think it's good you know if you're doing education or health just really target um you can go in there before you actually get in there with an idea about what you're looking for and try to zero in on that don't don't sort of be too broad um just pick pick the kind of key themes three three or four key themes and stick to it um and stay calm yeah, I'd echo the stay calm and also be a little bit prepared. If you can be a little prepared, if you've got a particular interest in um, an issue in a part of the budget in a particular project, have some have some a couple of quick notes written down about that so you can compare directly. So you're not just lugging heaps of books and juggling them and all the rest of it. If you've got that before you go in, great. You also know, we, I mean, we know some of what this is going to be because of the public narrative around it. We know it's going to be tough. So we know you're looking for cuts for taxes, for different initiatives. You know you're looking for those couple of things straight up, how bad a financial mess are we in? That's the sort of story of this budget. So if you think about, uh, I presume, if you think about that going in and have, as the guys have said, just a, a couple of key themes within that, things you absolutely want to find and reference, then you're you're halfway there. And, yeah, I'll echo all those words. Also just little things like bring a highlighter, bring some Post-it notes, Jot down things as you're going, and I think post-it notes are probably the best because you can flick back to really important things. But otherwise, uh, just you know, soak it up if it's your first time in there. And you, you, it's a really, it's a really, as a journalist, a good experience because you're, it's it's really meaty, and and you've got to work under pressure, and it's a good thing. And everyone's in there together, facing the same pressures. So. It's um, it's good. Heidi, you wanted to add something else? One last thing: take a strong coffee with you, and sometimes just some sweets because lunch is a little bit further down the track. You'll have already done some hard brain time by the time lunch arrives. And don't forget to drink water. <laughs> Thanks, Stay Dad. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you to both of you, Nick. Thanks, Richard. Thanks very much, Heidi, Josh, and Richard. Uh, I uh, I think I'm going to get uh, a beer and some pizza now. Um, it, to just echo what you just heard, I, I think it's it's a great experience being in a budget, um, and it does, as Josh says, it does feel a bit like you know that post exam sense when you walk out of there. You kind of you're feeling tired, but maybe a bit exhilarated as well. So I hope you I hope you do get that sensation next Tuesday. If you don't, and you still have a hankering to hear a bit more, there are some spots available at the Treasurer Tim Palliser's post-budget lunch, which we're co-hosting with Vecchi uh, next Wednesday. Uh, if you if you want to come along to that, just email us at the press club and we'll try and find a spot for you. Uh, and if state politics is your bag, we've also got an event coming up on June 14 with the Leader of the Opposition, John Pizzuto, and we'd be keen to see you there. Um, if you're not a member already, please join up. Please keep an eye on uh, what we're up to. Um, we love having you part of what we do, and we've got so many people who are willing to share their experience and their expertise 
like these three have done today. So thanks for being part of it. We look forward to seeing you at some other Melbourne Press Club event in the very near future. Thanks very much.